blessed day to be in the house of the Lord. I almost put on shorts and sandals, but I couldn't find any, <laughs> any sandals. <laughs> Amen. But we just bless the name of the Lord tonight. Amen. So we want to welcome you all out to uh, Family Matters. Amen. This month is Family Emphasis Week. And uh, our hashtag for this month is hashtag Family Matters. And so when you're sharing posts and everything tonight and on Sunday, put that in there. Family matters. Hashtag family matters. Family matters at Calvary, whatever way you want to do it. And so tonight we're going to do uh, family therapy, family therapy night. And so uh, we're getting ready to delve, delve into uh, some things that I believe are going to help all of us. Uh, in our families as well as our individuals. And so for those of you uh, that are chiming in on Facebook, on YouTube, you definitely want to share this. You definitely want to share this, uh, this feed tonight on your page and put in hashtag family matters or family matters at Calvary. So I'm looking up my Facebook because I want to make sure that I am on live uh, so that I can watch and share. And then we also want to be available to catch questions uh, that the audience may have, those that are watching online. Amen. Let's open up with a word of prayer. Father God, in Jesus' name, we thank you tonight. Father, we give you glory, we give you honor, and we give you praise. Father, we bless your name because you are great, you are holy, you are sovereign, Father. You're worthy of all of our praise, Father. But for your grace, where would we be? And so, Father, we thank you tonight that you've allowed us to assemble here together in your house, in your temple, in your presence, in your courts yet once again. And we just ask, Holy Spirit, that you would navigate this conversation tonight, that you would lead the conversation, that you would give each of us what to say. We pray, Holy Spirit, that tonight our words would be in season and that they will be seasoned with grace. And we pray, Lord God, for articulation. Uh, and we thank you, Father, for precision of thought. And we give you praise. Bind the hand of the enemy that would try to hinder anything tonight. We take authority over you, Satan, and we bind you now. You cannot function. You cannot speak. You cannot operate in this moment because we rebuke you in Jesus' name. And so, Father, we pray, Lord God, that those that need to hear will join online. They will come running into this building, Father. And we pray, God, that lives will be impacted, that lives will be changed, that families will be made all the better as a result. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you. For those of you who are here tonight joining in person, amen. God bless each one of you as I'm finding Facebook Live uh, and going on. And I'm going to encourage you all if you want to um, are your phones? Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. But I want us to be able to catch questions. Uh, if people uh, put questions in on Facebook and on YouTube. And so what that means is if you're watching live on Facebook and YouTube tonight, when we get to questions and answers, or if you have comments as we are dialoguing and speaking, we're going to encouraging you to put that information in, and we're going to do our best to double back and make sure that we address your comments or acknowledge them, and um, also acknowledge the questions that you all may have. For those of you who are uh, joining us tonight in person, there's a microphone here. If you would like to share at that time or ask questions at that time, then you'll be able to step here uh, on the microphone so that you can be heard uh, by everyone. Amen? Amen. So um, real quickly, I just want to um, take a moment and allow our, our panelists to introduce um, ourselves. Uh, we're going to state our names, our practices, businesses, what it is that we do, uh, things of that nature, um, and how you can contact any of them. So we'll start with our guest here to my left, right, far right, and then we'll just work our way around. Hello, my name is Kelly Loudon. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. Um, been practicing social work for over 25 years. Um, work, have worked in the school system, medical system, hospice, um, currently in a high school setting as well as a private, private practice, specializing in individual, family, couples, grief, counseling. Awesome. My name is Janelle Coxfay. 
and I am a licensed social worker, um, also a certified life coach. Um, I've been a well, I've been in the high school setting for the past 25 years. Um, so I've been a school social worker for 25 years, and um, I came out of child welfare. Um, so I wow. specialize, and I really, really love working with women and adolescents. Awesome. Good evening. My name is Lady British Thomas. Um, I'm an educator and a current student uh, uh, in a pastoral counseling program. And I'm excited about uh, this opportunity um, to share and to learn and to enjoy this family therapy night. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome, awesome, and uh, so I'm switching hats tonight. I'm Anthony Thomas of Thomas Counseling and Consulting Services um, that I actually partner with my wife, and we work to do that together. Uh, we work with a lot of couples. I do a lot of coaching and mentoring uh, with teenage and young adult men uh, in the time that, I, that I'm doing Thomas CCS. That's, the, that's the, pretty much the population that I'm working with, my wife and I. Uh, we do a lot of work with couples who are engaged and wanting to be married. Uh, we spend lots of time with them uh, at Thomas Consulting and Counseling Services. So that's who we all are. Uh, I also am a high school counselor uh, as well. So we do a lot of work there with teenagers um, across the gambit, social emotional issues, as well as academic planning uh, so they can move forward uh, with their lives after high school. So um, we're going to hurry up and get into our conversations tonight. Um, and this is an open conversation. You get to be a part of this conversation. It's not a lecture. It's not a workshop. Uh, so we're talking about family therapy. Why family therapy? I, I wanted to talk about this and include this as one of our Wednesday nights uh, in our Family Emphasis Month uh, because I feel that uh, number one, largely in our community, uh, we, we need to spend more time uh, encouraging people, educating people about the power of therapy and the power of counseling. Um, I think that for far too long, uh, we've been an absent present, both as practitioners as well as clients. And so over the past maybe 10 years uh, that I've been doing this work outside of the school setting, uh, I tell my story everywhere I go. I am not ashamed to say that my name is Anthony and I have a therapist. <laughs> and it's not because I have a mental health issue. It's not because I feel like X, Y, and Z. It's because it's there for me. It's a service and uh, it has been helping me uh, to navigate life over the past uh, few years and I go as I need it. And so we just want to talk about tonight in family therapy, some of the uh, topics, common concerns or issues that individually we see that we encounter in our work uh, and, and want to shed some light on some things. Uh, so you won't learn about our clients. You'll just learn about different concepts or ideas or themes that we have or are running into uh, in, this, in, in this time and in this season. And so... Uh, I'm going to ask any of our guests if you have one that you'd like to share out with um, in terms of, of a, a trend or a commonality that you're noticing uh, in your practice or just as a need uh, for therapy areas. So the trend that I'm noticing currently um, and probably it began, probably began a little bit before the pandemic, but certainly was heightened during the pandemic is lots of anxiety, lots of young um, adolescent, early, early um, adults, youth, you know, having anxiety issues. Like that is a major um, trend currently with mental health, just people suffering from anxiety. And I would like to add too that anxiety typically leads into depression. So um, across the board, I've seen it um, quite a bit in our adolescents uh, suffering with depression. And that's prior to the pandemic, mm -hmm. but it intensified. Um, when COVID hit, it intensified for sure. Mm -hmm. 
Also, uh, to add to that, uh, the pro the uh, situations that that's been happening in the home with uh, couples, with married couples, has also increased as well. I think there's been more time, you know, spent at home, mm -hmm. and it has caused, you know, a little more friction as well in the home. So we've seen an increase in that as well. So I'm, I'm going to agree with all of you, and I think that, that COVID has caused to manifest a lot of stuff that was there. Uh, at one point, uh, we read an article in a professional development that I was in, and it was almost as if the facilitators were saying that COVID caused these things. And I, I didn't agree fully to the extent that I don't think COVID caused the anxiety, the depression, the marital and family issues. I think, like you said, uh, Lady British, that the concentration of time and closeness together inside the home just almost put a magnifying glass on, on these things and caused them to intensify uh, and, and to push up. And so I think that in the wake of the pandemic and the, I'm going to call it the pre-post, mm -hmm. right? So I think we're in the pre-ending of it, if that makes any sense. So I'm going to say the pre-post uh, stage of the pandemic currently, uh, that it's left a lot of people with a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. Families, households, couples. Um, I even think about engaged couples that had to be separated because of COVID and things of that nature, physically separated, uh, and, 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 and then challenged to move forward. So uh, great topics and I think relevant trends uh, that, that we have. Um, so we have a video, and I think we'll start with the anxiety piece, uh, because anxiety, I think, and you all can help me with this uh, as, as they prepare the video, I feel that anxiety is a heightened level of stress, but I think that it kind of, it sneaks up on people. I think that the anxiety, uh, I call it stress intensified. That's just kind of the way I look at it. And I've learned that you can't live life without stress. Like stress is a natural occurring part of life but it's how you manage stress, right? And so that there's some stress, there's stress now. We're all sitting on stews. There's stress on the stews, and the stews had to endure stress testing to make sure that it could carry whatever the max weight is, right? And so life is is made, I'm trying not to preach y'all. Don't, don't say amen, please. No. Uh, <laughs> like, right, right. Life is made to, uh, to have stress, and so that has to be tested. And so I think that when a person fails the stress test, I think it leads right into that anxiety. And so we'll take that and we'll introduce this video and then after the video, we'll all chime in about anxiety. I have been a social worker here for the past 26 years. In today's climate, especially with the pandemic, one of the most prevalent issues plaguing our students and society is anxiety. According to the National Institute of Health, anxiety disorders are the most common mental illnesses in the United States today. Anxiety disorders affect 25.1% of children between the ages of 13 and 18 years old. Research shows that untreated children with anxiety disorders perform poorly in school and is the leading gateway to depression and substance abuse. The number one contribution to anxiety today is the residuals of the effect of COVID-19. The fact that they were, students were quarantined, they were on lockdown, they couldn't get out, e-learning, um, and deaths. Lots of our students lost lots of family members and friends during this time. Three of the contributing factors to anxiety with our youth is social media, number one, community violence and standardized testing. Test anxiety is one of the greatest anxiety contributors. My name is Julius Patterson. I am one of the school social workers here at Thornton Township High School. The signs of anxiety include, but are not limited to, changes in behavior, trouble sleeping or concentrating, chronic physical fatigue, school avoidance, 
and poor school performance. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns regarding resources, please contact us via email. All the social workers' emails, me and Ms. Coxbay, numbers are readily available on the research packet provided and on the school website. So, wow, look at you, Janelle. You famous, you on TV. <laughs> I know somebody famous, y'all. Can you sign my stuff? <laughs> uh, so, Janelle, why don't you take us to a little bit uh, deeper conversation um, about anxiety? And then um, also, too, I'm sorry, and talk about it at some point. We'll all get into it, how it impacts the family. Um, this year, I will honestly admit, it was a rough year. Uh, we came back into the school year. Um, our school district never left remote. We stayed remote learning the whole entire school year. So we had incoming freshmen that came straight in from eighth grade, but technically they came in from seventh grade. Um, so socially, emotionally, they were still in seventh grade. Um, and then we had lots and lots of losses. Um, I've never seen so many parents and guardians pass away. So um, it, it led me to have to, we had to really come up with um, different types of groups to support all of our students. Um, we, I did a, about probably seven um, groups on loss alone, death, you know, lo you know loss. Um, I remember this year going out to a home, this is during COVID, it was um, some of the support staff went out to some of the families' homes when the students weren't, you know, you know, getting on the computer for e-learning. And we were calling the homes and we're getting no answers. Um, so we went out to a home um, and the mom came to the door, you know, we were all masked up and we, you know, we had our social distance. And she came to the door and she says, I'm so sorry. She says, she had two students in our building. She said, I'm so sorry, you know, they have COVID. Um, we've been really sick. Um, I've lost my job. I'm really going through some really serious issues. So, you know, I took down notes and I just tried to see, you know, what I can do to help support the family. Sure enough, um, the school year started. Um, we were probably two weeks in and that mother passed. Um, so we were left with, not only did our students lose their parent, but then they became displaced. So I had a senior um, and then I had a, it was a sophomore. And when I tell you, it was really, really rough for all of us. Um, but that's just one, you know. So it was, it was, it's been a very, very trying year. It's getting better. Um, but um, for the most part, uh, the anxiety and depression has really plagued our building, building pretty good. I don't have my phone, but I... I think we, it would be helpful if we could define what anxiety is because um, as we're talking about this, um, grief can mimic anxiety. Um, depression can mimic anxiety. Just having stress, which is a typical normal occurrence that we all experience on a day-to-day -day level. Um, so we, I don't have mine. I would pull up and, and read the West Webster's definition of um, anxiety. A feeling of worry, nervousness, or unease, typically about an imminent event or something with an uncertain outcome. Okay. So I just wanted to say that on a normal day, any of us can experience that. What makes it anxiety is when it is chronic, um, ongoing, and acute. Like you can't shake this. You can't, you can't go home and take a bubble bath or relax, go get your, pedic you know, your nails done, whatever you do to relax yourself. Those things just don't work. That feeling is still there day after day after day. So kind of like Lady British said, you can't shake this. You can't, and it's with you. And that's ongoing. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was thinking about it, I said, oh. <laughs> you have a question or a comment from our live audience. <laughs> <laughs> it, it helped me to relate a lot to it. That when I was working, 
I used to have like panic attacks, anxiety attacks, and I couldn't pinpoint what was going on. I mean, I'm driving and all of a sudden I feel like I'm gonna have a heart attack. And so I called my husband, I said, honey, I'm on 87th on the Dan Ryan. I think I'm gonna have a heart attack. So I ran into the, um, the Burger King and they called the ambulance. By that time, my husband and his brother got there and we, they took me to the hospital. I'm with my girlfriend. We're coming on Lakeshore Drive and I told her, I think I'm having a heart attack. So she takes me to the hospital. I moved to my new my house when I first got it with my other girlfriend. <laughs> and she's taking me to the hospital. And it was ongoing and I couldn't pinpoint what was it. I, I was it could have been my job. I was having pressure with one of the uh, managers on my job. I don't know exactly, but I'm kind of trying to relate to what is causing it because when they checked my heart and everything, they said, oh, there's nothing wrong. Of course, my girlfriend said, do you know she's having a heart attack? What, you know, so I, you know. But after that, they gave me pills. I think it was Xanax or something. And I said, this is a drug. I don't want to take a drug. But the fact that they gave me the pills, I kept the pills. Because I said, if it's not physical, it's mental. So I kept the pills, and the pills became like a, a little crutch for me just in case. Mm -hmm. And the next thing, after years and years and past, I saw those pills turn to powder because I never used it. I realized that what I was experiencing was something mental and mm -hmm. not physical. But I had to come to the realization that that's what it was, that there really wasn't anything physical. So sometimes if you could actually realize that your situation is a mental situation, it, it helped me. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, I was going to the, I mean, I was almost going to the hospital once every two weeks to the emergency room. Wow. That they almost knew me by name, <laughs> you know. So, but once I realized it was something mental, and I just started working on the situation tr and praying and, and just asking the Lord to just let me have the peace and not lean to the what things that surround me. And eventually, and those pills, they turned to powder. I don't know what happened. I think I threw them away, but I never took one pill. Mm. So I just want to comment on what you were saying. Um, panic attacks can mimic um, the symptoms of a heart attack because you will have the heart palpitations. Mm -hmm. Yes. You're feeling lightheaded, faint. So we do want to encourage anyone that are experiencing those symptoms to go to the hospital yes. and not self-diagnose. Because mm -hmm. you may think, oh, well, maybe this is just this, this, and this. But we yeah, would encourage every everyone time. to go to every time. <laughs> and let a doctor tell you that, yes. okay, we've done the test and it's nothing with the heart. Mm -hmm. So just mm -hmm. keep that in mind. Yes. Mm -hmm. Not to self-diagnose yourself, right. but Absolutely. you have it. Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> So I'll say too that, and then and she just stated that that she started praying about and got to what the root issue is, and that is one of the uh, I think powerful aspects of of the therapeutic process is that it it helps the client get to what is the issue, um, and it's a lot of times like you know we treat symptoms. But until we get to what the real issue or the cause is, thank you, at the core, then we can deal with it. And so what is causing this anxiety? What, what is this imminent uh, fear, emotion, danger that's there that I need to address? And then if I can address that, then things will just start to dissipate because we're getting right down to the core. Kelly, would you talk a little bit more about uh, things that mimic anxiety? Is that what you said? I want to make sure I'm... Well, I was saying things that kind of mimic panic, atta panic, panic attack and heart attacks because a lot of people do end up in the emergency room after experiencing stressful events um, with heart palpitations, feeling lightheaded or faint, excessive, um, you may have excessive gas or heartburn. And, and so you're thinking, oh my gosh, and, you know, and, and then the breathing, the um, hyper... Yeah. Heart, and, and you would think... Okay, I, something's wrong with me. Something. So, 
that would mimic um, anxiety symptoms. Mm. But like I was saying earlier too, grief can m mimic um, anxiety mm. symptoms. Um, stress, certainly, marital conflict, peer conflict, um, disappointment, let down on the job, relationships, like all of that can kind of, all of those overlap. Um, I think what leads us into a diagnosis of anxiety is when it's chronic and ongoing and cannot be relieved by your normal go-tos. And it is significantly impacting your day-to-day -day functioning. So, so you said chronic, ongoing, acute, acute, yes. and limits daily, normal daily, daily function. Daily, right. Can you can you clarify acute for our listeners? Acute would just mean like it's severity. It is severe. It is not just a mild case of the blues, it, you know, oh, it's raining outside and I'm feeling a little down, mm -hmm. but the next day I'm back to my normal self or a friend can call and, you know, that kind of lifted my mood. Those type of things, like I said, the average person goes through day to day. But if that feeling is going day after day after day and is beginning to significantly impact work, relationships, um, your ability, yeah then that's when I think people should, you know, seek help. seek help and be willing to be evaluated. I think one thing that we have not talked about is there is such a stigma when you hear the word mental health. Mm -hmm. And that should, we need to, as a community, um, as a race, erase that. Because that, that stigma should not be there and that has kept us um, dealing with certain issues generationally, year after year after mm -hmm. year, generation after generation after generation, because we have been taught you just don't talk about it. You just, you know, yeah. bury it to the side. This shouldn't... Right. Minorities, we grow up, and I won't just say as blacks, as Hispanics, I saw a lot of that too. Um, what happens in my house, stay in my house. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's no one business, you know, what we're dealing with in this household. And so it leaves you in a place of um, complacency, you know, and you're constantly internalizing something that needs to be dealt with. And it leaves you in a place of maladaptive coping styles. So that's when the alcohol use, the substance use, um, spending, um, abuse, all of those things can become come into play because you're trying to externally deal with feelings that are internal and you just don't know how. You learn the wrong way how to cope and deal with what's going on internally. And I also want to speak to that when you talked about Janelle, how we we have this, we had this thing, many families, what happens at home stays at home, you know, don't go to school telling people this and, you know, them, them people, mandated reporters and those kinds of conversations. But I also want to talk about it. Um, I had an opportunity, ooh, maybe close to 10 years ago now, when uh, I was invited to share at a church conference about mental health and Christians. Because when you grow up like I did in the Pentecostal church, you know, a lot of stuff was a demon. And, you know, we had to cast out these demons. Now, I still do believe in demon activity and demonization and that you have to, you know, these kind come out except by fast, you know, but through fasting and praying. And so I get that part of it. But what this particular church was doing was they were shining the light 10 years ago on mental health. And, and, and I went and I did some workshops with them uh, to bring it out and that there are you need to know. When, when, it, when this is a, a spiritual matter and when this is a mental health matter. Uh, and I think that as Christians, we should pray through uh, and ask the Holy Spirit for discernment and, 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 and help us to know when do I need to sit and talk through this with someone. Uh, the scripture says that in, in his own eyes, a man's ways are right. And so the average one of us, we don't think we're okay. You know, like, oh, it's just a little drink. It's just a little smoke. It's just a little girl on the side. It's just this. It's just that. It won't hurt. What's the, fav what's the famous line? I could stop if I want to. 
Right. The, so just like scripture says, in his, in a, a man's ways are right in his own eyes. And so that's why I appreciate the fact that we continue to open and bring out and discuss these types of matters and these types of issues so that people understand that there's some difference that I need to I need to think through some things. I need to talk through some things so that I can determine what this is that I'm dealing with. And I think that if not with a counselor, if not with a therapist, certainly with people who are going to tell you the truth. You know, you don't need uh, in your circle, you don't need a bunch of, yep, you right, girl. Yeah, man. Yep, 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 yep. Amen. Yep. You know, you, you good. And they're just watching you die. They're watching you just suffer mentally and emotionally. We need people in our circle that will say things to us like, no, you're thinking too deep, you know, or have you considered this, you know, to bring it or say, hey, listen, let me introduce you to my therapist or let you come talk to, you know, my first lady or my lady, Lady British, right? Or come, you know, get, get the resources and, and then begin to engage these conversations so that, that people can understand that once you talk through it, and when I was in school for counseling, uh, it's the role of the therapist to do more listening than speaking. Absolutely. And as, as people speak and talk and they're asked the right questions, we just talk up on the answer. We talk up on the resolve. And, and I think that's important. Well, I feel like from working in private practice, a lot of people already know, um, they already know the answer, but their fear or they're just struggling with making that next step. Like there's, and you just have this extra person to guide you and walk you through what you already know to be, you know, the right, not the right thing, or what's best for you, what's in the best interest for you at that given moment. And understand that in counseling, it's a space where you can be true. You know, the most difficult part is saying, okay, I need it. The next step is getting it. But understanding that that person is confidential. You know, it's a confidential space. So that is the one time you don't have to worry about hearing what your girlfriend has to say about her problems, mm -hmm. right? What your husband thinks about what you're saying. It's non-biased. And that person is paid to listen to you for that hour, hour and a half about you. It's all about you. And so you can expose yourself, you know, and, and I always say this, when you go to a counselor and if, 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 it, if that person don't particularly meet your fancy, you, you try another one. You know, if you go to a medical doctor and that medical doctor don't make you feel comfortable, would you stay? Right. No. So when you make that decision and when you take that step, understand that's a place where you can be vulnerable. You can be true and, you know, you can open up. So I want to say to that piece that Kelly that you mentioned, you know, a lot of times people approach counseling knowing the answers. Um, I agree with that. I want to add to that. A lot of times I see where the answer they thought they had is not it. Not it. And it's amazing to watch how uh, the clients start to connect dots. When, when the right, when the empathetic questions are asked and it's, it's causing or forcing them to really think mm -hmm. about either what they said or what they're experiencing. And then when they start connecting dots, to me, it, it's just always amazing to see the light bulbs go off. And it's usually uh, introspective type of thing. They're like, oh, I have to, right? Because, and I say this all the time, it, it, it's, it, it's, using the I statements mm -hmm. and not you. I say all the time, if I come up to you and I was like, you know, I'll just say, I don't know, I'm going to say Thelma, you, she's not going to do this, but I think emotionally and mentally, this is what a, this is what we do. When somebody says you, it's like me what? And we're already at this defensive stance, you know, and so the I statements, you know, the, the power of I statements, it, number one, it disarms the other person. And so when, when I do a lot of that type of work and, and coaching and mentoring is, is teaching people the power of I statements. Because when you use an I statement, you start off talking about yourself and the other person to whom you're communicating, they're, they're relaxed. 
And then it's I feel, I think, is usually some emotion, right? And then you're able to state the emotion and you're able to state the stimulus that caused the emotion. And that could be as a result of the other person. So I felt discouraged when you said, I don't look nice in that tie or whatever, right? And so I state all of that out and then it gives the other person an opportunity to respond you know, for, you know, whatever, and it keeps the conversation going. I said that to say that I have been amazed at the number of people that I, that I do this work with when it comes to I statements. Mm -hmm. Like the challenge of people to really practice and, and formulate I statements because we don't always see ourselves as the person who needs the help. Like you said, Kelly, we, we approach kind of already feeling like we know what we need, we have the answer, and we have it all together. So I just want to say those I statements force you to take accountability for your feelings. And we're so used to projecting yep. those feelings onto others. But that I statement, when, I, when you state I feel discouraged, that's your feeling. And something I did made you feel that way, but you have to take ownership of the feelings because nobody can make you feel a certain way. You feel what you feel based on your experiences. Mm -hmm. So you have to take ownership for those feelings. Yeah. And I teach people too, it, like you said, it's your feeling. It's we, your can't, feeling. we can't control the emotion that's stirred or you know, right. unnerved, but we can control our response to that emotion. And I think that when we learn those types of skills and those types of strategies, then we're actually able to navigate to navigate mm -hmm. any kind of relationship, any you know, as we as we move forward. And sometimes it's with ourselves. Absolutely. It's it's with ourselves at the at the risk of self disclosing um, with with my weight loss, which was like five years and actually all three of you were a part of that journey we all, all done different things but um i had to reckon with myself and i learned that then i was eating out of stress and depressive moments and so i would have to tell myself i feel whatever whatever because this one's sick, this one, you know what, I have to start identifying my depressors and my stressors so that I could tell me, you don't need to eat that. That's I mean, that, that's a whole nother topic I could talk about, but it's just that whole conversation of understanding I statements and communicating. I also want to uh, emphasize the importance of valuing the way you feel or respond to a matter because one may look at the way they feel about something and may uh, think of it from a negative perspective because it may not, you know, may not be a good feeling. But it choosing to respond in a way that will help really is to put things in perspective because if the feeling is it's you know it's it you're you're truly uh, identifying the feeling, and you decide to share that feeling. You ask yourself what caused this feeling. Get it, it, again. It goes back to getting to the root, you know, of the matter. What caused this feeling? And so what you're doing is you're actually taking a negative and turning it into a positive because you determine what once you determine what caused the feeling, then you deal with the matter. And the positive of that is number one, you were able to identify the matter, and number two, you were able to deal with the matter, in which that brings about the solution of the matter. So it's, it's okay, you know, if, if you get angry about something, identify what caused the anger and then deal with that, that situation from its root. And now you bring solution. That's good. Yep. As, as you're coming, I'm going to read a couple of comments on uh, Facebook. Uh, the patient, or in this case, the client, is encouraged to consider and expose in, a, in an effort to discover what is the problem. So the clients, you know, gotta, they have to do some navigating. It's all about the questions being asked that will bring us to the point of discovery. Um, I agree with that. 
Anxiety disorder and panic attacks are the efforts we engage to control situations that are beyond our control. Someone commented that on Facebook. He, Is it on? Yes. I'm sorry, I wasn't. Um, I'm hearing a lot of suicides going on because, you know, we're on the prayer line and we've heard where several young people have committed suicide, uh, even some that I've known when I'm down south and just people that you would have never thought. And I couldn't fathom and said, you know, they seem so happy. They got a good home and everything is every, you know, going well from my from what I can see, and yet they take their own life. And then I'm hearing a lot with, with when the COVID came, there's a lot of drugs that's being administered out there. And I notice now when someone goes to the doctor, do you have suicidal tendency? Right. And my question is, the reason they're asking, it's because so many drugs are being distributed to people now, and the side effects, even when we hear it on TV, uh, side effects, suicidal tendencies. So I know a lot of things can be emotional, but I think it could also be uh, provoked by certain drugs that one, are, one is taking, and maybe the doctors are not looking at all the drugs they're taking when they prescribe other drugs. And, and so, it, you know, it's like we really have to be, especially parents if they know, or even adults too, we have to tell the doctors, you know, what type of drugs we're on or taking. Like, I have a glaucoma. What effects would that have if I took this or something like that? But most of the drugs now, the side effects is suicidal tendency. So it's, it's a question is, could it all be mental or could it also be some physical things from what we're taking and being prescribed because we don't know? I think it can be certainly both. Um, there are significant side effects with most medications that we take. But suicidal ideation and suicidal tendencies um, are a result of clinical depression. And that is a physiolog physiological um, condition within the body that some people cannot um, work their way through without medication. So. If you um, choose to take the medication route, and I um, am not a proponent for medication or against medication, but I have worked with um, children, youth, that every treatment, everything has not worked, and I would recommend that a parent put their child on medication because some things you, you just can't do on your own and you do need um, help with. But if you choose to take the medication, I agree with you, you need to be followed by your doctor regularly. You need to know what those side effects. You need to be monitored. Like you need a strong support system in your life that is, you know, observing that, oh, well, his behavior's changed. You know, he's in his room more often. He's not eating, he's isolating. And if all those things are beginning, if there's changes in behavior, then okay, maybe that medication is not, you know, working. It needs to be altered or different medication tried. So, but I'm not completely against medication, um, and it is not for everyone, but some, some people do need it. Speaking from a nutritional standpoint, uh, C. Craig Lewis came um, about maybe six, seven years ago. He mentioned that um, there would be a, an issue with genetically modified foods, particularly mm -hmm. soy foods and soy-based um, additives and in ingredients. Um, in our parents' day, and in our grandparents' day, we had real food. We had s strawberries in, from July to September. We had corn from August to early October. We had asp um, asparagus, you know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah, the almanac mattered. So now <clears throat> we're, we're, we're violating the God-ordained order for time and season, and we're having strawberries all year. That's not the plan. That's not the way God intended. Uh, we, we're not letting the soil rest, you know. 
we're shipping foods from different areas and different regions. You know, was it intended for us to to eat South American apples, you know, in North America? We don't know. And from a nutritional standpoint, I just wanted to know what how does that impact? I'm not a medical person, but you all be having experience with the DSM, DSM-5s and things like that, and then spiritually speaking as well, us being out of order and not obeying season and time and taking genetically modified foods, what do you think that's doing in response to the suicidal and medical impacts? Right. Oh, no, so sometimes no, no, no. with um, medical, <laughs> <laughs> nutritional, well, the truth of the matter is food does make a difference. Um, if I have a student, and I'm, I'm going to just be general, I'm only going to get into the, the seasons of food. We know that's major. Um, but is a student that come in my office in the morning time eating flaming Hots, is that going to affect them? Absolutely. It's going to affect how they process. It's going to affect how they deal with um, emotion. Um, it's hard for flaming Hots to not make you angry. <laughs> you know? And so when they walk in my office and they got flaming hots, and I'm like, this is your breakfast? Um, and you know what I'm saying. It, it happens. So, yes, food definitely, definitely impacts um, how you feel, how you think. I mean, I'm, I don't mean to get gross, but I've had students that actually have been constipated for months. And it's unbelievable that it's just okay in their household. How can being constipated not depressed? Be, you, you are depressed. It's impossible for you not to get depressed. You have waste inside of you that you cannot get out. And it's, it's the compound of things that you're eating. No fruits, no vegetables in their diet. Everything they drink is full of sugar. So it definitely, definitely, trust me when I say this, it impacts them. And I was going to add to that. I feel like your the diet that the um, traditional American diet probably has more significant side effects from you than pharmaceutical medications. Absolutely. We eat sugar, fat, sugar, them. that red dye number 40, that is research proven that that alters mood and everything. So I, I feel like the, our diet contributes more than, our, than the pharmaceutical. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Such an interesting topic. <laughs> One of my favorite. I just want to share that um, probably before most of you were born, I um, was a <laughs> psychiatric at that time nurse. Mm. We were not allowed to call them ourselves psychiatric nurses because it put a stigma mm -hmm. on the client. So we had to change the terminology to behavior wow. medicine. Mm -hmm. So that, to me, uh, is one of my areas of expertise, and I certainly appreciate your areas. Um, I just want to say that, and this is Mental Health Month, we have to keep in mind that mental health is real. It is as real as physical health. Mm -hmm. And unless it's treated, if you don't treat that heart attack, there's going to be some serious consequences as a result. If you don't treat the mental health, we can see the consequences we can see it in our homes, in our neighborhoods, violence and all of that. They are just acting because they really do need some medicine. Mm -hmm. And I am a strong proponent <laughs> of medication. I do, however, want to say that when you see side effects, it should say possible side effects. Mm -hmm. Because we don't want to categorize side effects being suicidal for everyone, mm -hmm. which would 
draw you back from taking the medication. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to take that because it's going to cause su suicidal ideation. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's not applicable to everyone. Right. It may be, it's a possibility that it can be applicable to some, mm -hmm. but not all. So my recommendation to all of us is to, if you need medicine, you better take it. If you know someone that needs medicine, encourage them to take their medication. Mm -hmm. That's what it's for. Because sometimes the physiological component of it has to be taken care of. It has to be taken care of. And if it's not taken care of, we got some serious problems. Mm -hmm. Problems that we really don't need mm -hmm. to um, deal with. Unfortunately, and I'm going to sit down, society has failed us. They've closed down all the mental health yes, facilities. They yes, they have. So where do you go for help? Mm -hmm. Where do you go? That's good. But to the Lord. <laughs> you know, and I know prayer answers all things, but we need to think about this thing from a serious standpoint and encourage if they need to sit on a couch, sit on the couch. Mm -hmm. If they need to take some medicine, take some medicine. Thank you. <laughs> and you know, and I'm in agreement with you on that. Um, when I have a student that is su suicidal, um, or a client that's suicidal, and they go into the hospital, um, the most important thing they need is to be able to get counsel when they come out. So sometimes they are, you know, they are told that they have to, you know, take medication. Um, but oftentimes, it could be because of their insurance. Um, or lack of counselors in their area, you know, especially if you're dealing with poverty, poverty areas, um, they don't ha they don't have the ability, to, you know, to get counseling. So sometimes I'll ha we'll have students that come out of the hospital, um, and they cannot get counseling. I mean, they're on waiting lists for weeks, um, sometimes months. So what you're saying is absolutely correct. Um, when you come out and you've you've had a scare like that, you've had you know suicidal thoughts, or you've attempted suicide. Um, you definitely need the aftercare, um, and you do need to monitor that medication. And if it is some issues there, then go back. Sometimes you just have to take it long enough for it to, you know, get into your system. Um, sometimes people want to give up before they see the results. So um, definitely, definitely having proper um, doctor care when you're taking your medication is definitely necessary. I was going to say... Um that, that whole piece there, the foods, the side effects, and you're right, possible, because when you hear them speed up in a commercial and it says, possible side effects could be, <laughs> right? Like you don't want you to really catch them all, right? But you're right, they are, they are possible, which means that they may or may not impact every individual. And then when you look at the, uh, the reasons or the different con considerations that have to be taken, you know, uh, race, ethnicity, mm -hmm. height, weight, all of this kind of thing that, that matters in terms of dosing medication. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I'm a big advocate of balance. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I, I worked my way through my eating off of blood pressure medication. And this was before um, my procedure to the weight loss re the two years ago, but I had a doctor that worked with me and that I monitor my blood pressure with the school nurse. I say, I don't want the battery thing, do it the old fashioned way till you feel my pulse and all of that. And I did it every other day and every 30 days, I went to my doctor and I showed him the chart in my phone and we worked it down and down until I didn't need it. But the reason that I could do without it was because of what I was eating. You just said you remembered that, right? The type of smoothie that I had to do. We'll get into healing lives in a little bit. But the type of food that I was eating, the type of smoothies that I was drinking that was providing for my body, my physiological body, what it needed, and then learning self-care strategies and things so that I'm not raising my blood pressure because, you know, this person getting on my nerve, I got this going on at work, this going on at home, this going at the church, and all this stuff hitting me, and I'm overwhelmed again all those kind of things and I say that to say that I learned and I had to switch doctors and my new doctor refused to discuss the blood pressure medication 
And even after I lost, I lost 90 pounds. And this doctor would not discuss with me coming off amlodipine, not even decreasing the dosage. Well, what's your goal weight? My goal weight is this. When you get there, we'll talk about it. Well, come on, let's look at, you know. And so for me, it, it's a balance of what are you eating? What kind of lifestyle are you living? Um, if you're on the medication, whether it's, you know, to support, you know, chemical imbalance in the body and help support mental health. I agree with you. Keep going. Check the dosage. We have students that we have to say, hey, mom, let's do something with the dosage here because he's talking like this. He's acting like this. She's doing this. She's erratic. She's, you know, it's not just suicide. It's a lot of, a lot of, lot of behaviors yeah. that go with that imbalance. And so I'm a proponent of balance. And so if there needs to be some therapy mixed with it, I have gotten to the point where I was taking half of blood pressure appeal because you know what I determined that you don't live with me and you don't know me well enough to be able to tell me some of this I'm gonna take your practice and your schooling and your knowledge and I'm gonna study for myself when I had when I had my procedure they gave me medication that was the same medicine that was prescribed for patients with um, what's the multiple multiple personalities um, schizophrenia and I'm like, what does it, I, I didn't even look. I just saw that, and I was like, I'm straight. Tylenol, extra trend, <laughs> give me a double dose, and I'm good. You know, like, what does a bariatric surgery patient have in common with someone who's schizophrenia? And, and I didn't look. I'm not saying that was the wrong medication. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying that that was enough for me. And then a medication I took once, it had me itching internally. Like, my entire body would itch for, like, hours. And I was like, I'm straight. Like, I can either bear this pain or it'll be just Tylenol. Say it again. Dr. when you got itching, that's a clinical sign of depression. See there? So it, it's, it's, it's a balance, and it's educating ourselves, and it's educating our community. And I had that, Dr. Dixon, in my notes, too, that it is Mental Health Awareness Month. And all these awareness ones, suicide awareness ones, we need to start paying attention to this stuff. Because you know what I learned? There's documentaries on Netflix about the food industry and the drug industry, and they all live in the same house. And it's all about the money. I'm going to say all, but it's, a, it's got a lot to do with money. Thank you. It's, it's driven by money. Um, any other thoughts? I had one more topic that I wanted to see if we could squeeze in, but I didn't want to shut anybody out. Anybody got something good? Man, this is some good stuff. We're going to run out of time. All right, so um, I had two things I want to talk about, but I only get to one of them. One of them is adjustment concerns for blended families. Blended families and, and, and adjusting to that. And then the other one is communication within families. Um, are the necessary things being discussed in families, in homes? I'm kind of talking about in homes. Are parents being transparent enough or caregivers? Because we understand in every home it's not parent, child. So are caregivers uh, being transparent enough? Which one of y'all want to go with? The blended family or the communication? Okay. Well, I actually came from a blended family. Um, had a stepmother, stepfather, and um, grew up with my mom and dad when my parents divorced. Um, a lot of my time was spent with my grandmother, grand, you know, my grandparents. Um, but we really had a healthy family, um, primarily because our, my parents were clear on who they were and they no longer desired one another. So um, they made great friends, and they co-parent me well. And so everyone was clear on their positions. My, my mother and my stepmother got along well. Uh, my dad and my stepfather got along well. So it was a cohesive family um, unit. Um, but there are many that don't work that way. And a lot of times that, that transpires just because, that, that transpires just because um, people have not got past hurt. Um, they have not gotten over something. Um, if it's a husband and wife that divorced, they haven't got over it. And he's moved on and remarried, or she's moved on and remarried. 
Um, so oftentimes, they haven't truly dealt with um, their issues. And so that's a lot of times what cause problems in the families. Yeah, I often say that I'm a poster child for a blended family. I say that a lot. And it sounds like your experience is as is, is much akin to mine, where there's this relationship or this friendship um, between the, the adults who have divorced and are comfortable with that. The un, thank you, keyword. The, the opposite of that, and something that I see working with families, is that a lot of times pe parents would use the child as a pawn for the other parent. And I see it a lot in teenage and millennial parents, but I also see it in parents of teenagers, parents in their 40s, 50s, where, and you said it perfectly, that when the adults don't deal with their issues, their concerns, and, and own their truths and are accountable, to themselves first, then the children typically end up suffering and then are used as pawns. And oh, you can't see your dad, and no, oh, you can't see your mom, or uh, you, you don't go over their house. We don't, you know, those people over there, you know. Or you don't have to do what she says do. She's not your ooh, mother. You get that one. Ooh. And so you're causing havoc and you're teaching that child not to respect that adult. So, and I'm not saying that if the, if the child is dealing with um, a step parent that's treating them wrong, not to deal with it, um, but to blatantly tell the child, you, you don't have to respect that person. It's just not, it's not fair for the child. Correct, yeah. And, and I have to navigate through that. Yeah, I'm saying that, that also, um, it spills over into the communication piece, mm -hmm. you know, and what, I guess should be properly communicated, you know, uh, as a family unit. Mm -hmm. and, and the lack of that communication is really part of the, uh, the, the root of the problems, mm -hmm. you know. And we know, of course, the problem itself, it, it goes even deeper than that. Mm -hmm. But because the communication is lacking, it, it really worsens the problem. Mm -hmm. Let me make a real quick statement. Back in the day, great grandmothers had children at 14, 15 years old. It's maturity. It's a word I use often, emotional maturity. We can be 75 years old and emotionally immature. So when you're dealing with um, young people, yes, it's all about experience, what you've been exposed to. Um, but that great grandmother that had those babies starting at 15 years old, they were raised to be a parent. They were raised to, you know, do what they're supposed to do in that marriage, take care of that child, take care of that husband, take care of that household. Um, we are in a different world now. Yes. Yes. But they gravitate toward that. Yes. And because they don't have, like our parents, well, our mm -hmm. grandparents, mm -hmm. they can't hear you online. Right. That's why I think. <laughs> that old school way. Yeah. Come here, baby. Let me tell you something. <laughs> I agree with that. The old mm -hmm. school was with our parents passing mm -hmm. things on Absolutely. from experience and experience. And it was good, solid experience mm -hmm. from generation to generation. Mm -hmm. Now, the passing on is from things that we see on the internet, mm -hmm. uh, YouTube, uh, TikTok, and all of that. And it's an unrealistic uh, idea of what life is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. and, and when you look at it and you see how confusing some of these young peoples are because of that. And yet they have children now mm -hmm. and they have to try to guide them when they too have been mis misinformed and misguided. So how do you cope with the, um, the situation where they too are not really equipped? And it, it, like I said, if I could bring my grandparents back, and if you could bring them back into that the way we were, mm -hmm. then it would, would definitely be a different 
situation. So I'm, I'm going to address that to this, this way. Two things. I have a theory, and I preach this often. Calvary, y'all hear me say this. Love is a fun discipline is a function of love. Discipline is a function of love. Without going into all the scripture, he loves, he chastens, right? He corrects, disciplines. And so the way grandparents and great-grandparents disciplined, this is my theory. You guys have it. So somebody take it and write it. I got it right here, okay? <laughs> this is my theory that we have said, how many of you that our parents have said, when I have children, I'm not. And we took away what was done to us because one of two things happened. Either our parents did not teach us why they disciplined and raised us the way that they did. Or number two, we never took the time to think about what our parents did and why they did before we diminished or extinguished this process or whatever it was. And so I think that over probably the last six generations, that discipline in rearing children has become so diluted until we need to have real old-fashioned parenting classes. The other thing is, when you talk about young people having children, it goes back to all this other stuff, the anxiety, the depression, the house, the suicide, the family, the lack of communication. Some young people have children to have a Cabbage Patch doll. Because they, and I have heard teenagers say this, I know my baby will love me. I know my son is going to love me. And so it gets to you need love. And so what are you going to do when you bring little Johnny into the world and little Johnny turns four and he's going through human development and he doesn't want to be under you. You're going, if rejection is the issue, you're going to feel rejected. When little Johnny wants to play with, you know, his toys instead of being in your bosom getting breast milk. He four. He shouldn't be there no way. Well, my, my mom did that work. By five, they got to come off. <laughs> By the latest is five, and that's too old. It got a mouthful of teeth. Go ahead. <laughs> and might I might add that also the government, the police department, and all of them are setting rules on how we discipline our child. Uh, my uh, brother-in-law was arrested because he disciplined his son, and he, his son called the police, and they put him in jail. Wow. My mom was... If that's the case, my mother should have been in jail for life. All you know, so it's, 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 it's uh, so many other things are happening, too, when they're trying to dictate to you how to raise your child. Uh, and the children are aware of that, and they will use that. And, you know, so we see that as well. Another, um, you know, remedy that really we need to bring back is the village. Because, yeah, we, you know, uh, like Janelle mentioned, you know, our grandparents and great-grandparents had children at, you know, 15, and you know, they made it and things of that nature. So young people having, you know, babies early is not, it's nothing new. But one, one area that is missing is the village. A lot of people don't like to say anything anymore, you know, ignoring it, you know, that's not my child or that's not my business. And it's a two, even that is a two way street because you have some people who don't want to receive the village, you know, and so it does go back to that word love too, you know, because the, if when, when the village loves on the individual and don't shun the individual and, you know, hammer them down for having a child, okay, it's, it's done now. So what are we going to do? You know, are we going to surround this person with love? You know, are we going to help this person to, to raise these children, you know, or this child, you know, with love and, and you know, help, nav help them navigate through that? Or are we going to just ignore it, you know, and talk about it? And, you know, uh, put them on the mourner's bench. How will we respond? Wow. One of the trends that I am seeing with young parents um, 
is this, um, in the absence of discipline is overindulgence. Mm -hmm. Young parents give their children too much. They don't want to see them cry and they don't want to see them unhappy. And, and I think that touches on what you were saying about an unfulfilled need that they have within themselves. Um, so I'm not going to discipline or I'm not going to say no to my child because I don't want to see them cry. I don't want them to be unhappy. But that's not realistic for life. And they never, the children are not developing the coping skills that they need to handle no's, frustration, disappointments. And so now, you know, you just have this, these young people with these kids that, they're afraid of. Mm -hmm. I mean, we work in high school and we have freshmen whose parents are afraid, afraid of them. Yeah. These kids tell their parents they're not coming to school, they're not coming in, they're going to stay at a friend's house. Mm -hmm. And these parents come to us like, what should I do? What? I don't know what to do. Can you? And I'm like, he's 14. So what, what are you talking about? So about five years ago, I had a student. Um, she came to school whenever she wanted to. And I mean, you guys, she was gorgeous. I mean, she had the weave down her back. I mean, she had the best pedicures, manicures. She looked great every day, like she had a serious job. Um, and her mother would call me at least twice a week asking Ms. Cox Bay, she's, I can't get her to come to school because she had to go to work early in the morning. So I get on the phone and say, get your tail here right now. Within about 30 minutes, she was there. And I asked the question. I asked one question. I said, why are you not coming to school? Why? Your mother's working hard. You know she's a single parent. She gives you everything. Why aren't you coming to school? You know what she told me? She said, there's no consequences. So what happened to us? Why don't our children have consequences? Why do I have to parent the parents when they come into my office space? I'm constantly having that real conversation. Get that phone out of hand and check and see who she's talking to. Check and see what she's doing. Well, I can't, I can't, you know, invade her privacy. I'm sorry. You pay, I'm paying that phone bill. Give me the code or you won't have a phone. And so if you begin, and I'm saying this to parents that are dealing with adolescents right now. If you begin to take back, take back. And I have to ask my parents, when you were a child, did your mother allow you to just do what you wanted to do? And they're like, no, absolutely not. So why are you doing it? You know, you don't, they don't have to have anything. So taking that power back, grabbing those phones, seeing where they are, and saying no sometimes. One, one quick thing. There is a misconception about discipline in the state of Illinois and DCFS. You can discipline your children. Yes, you can. And you can use corporal punishment. Yes, the can. state of Illinois is a couple. You cannot leave bruises or marks on your children. Absolutely. So when you begin to discipline and you are overly aggressive, angry, that's not a good time to discipline anyway. Right. But you can discipline your children. And parents... They could, everybody kind of uses that excuse, well, the, the police, the, the child will call the police on me. Okay, but that doesn't necessarily mean your child's gonna be taken away from you. I mean, anybody can call the police on you. That doesn't mean that it's um, founded or credible, but parents, I think, yeah, yeah. I've seen police officers that side with the parents. Yeah, because you can discipline your child. Mm -hmm. You can spank your child on the buttocks or, I mean, you know, of course not, yeah, not fist or face, head hits or anything like that because that is crossing over to abuse. There's a thin line between discipline, not that thin, but a discipline and abuse. Yeah, I, I think that that the that parenting piece is, again, the diminishment of it over years. I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to do that. And then generations, even the Bible talks about each generation becoming more wise yeah but yet more wicked, right. right? And so that there's a change in the generational dynamic. And so some parents are reading more, they're learning this, and they're trying timeout methods and, you know, take this away and doing these different things. Um, and then also we're in the age where children are, I was going to say, automatically more independent because of the technology that children 
well, we have conversations with our children. I'm like, how you know that? You know, and they're like, oh, it's right here. And they, they're, so they're more independent and they feel like, they feel like they're smarter than their parents. And I have had to tell young people, don't talk to me like I'm stupid. I just have to tell them that way. Because, and, and, and I understand how they could feel that way, but they have to be reminded that I'm not one of your peers, number one. Right. I don't know everything. I'm not going to always make the best decisions, but I'm not one of your peers. This is conversation with the Thomas children and whatever last name students I have at work. I have the same conversations, but you have to understand that you don't know it all, which is why I teach our children. You could say anything to me. You could ask me anything. Just do it respectfully. Absolutely. And I leave that door open so that when they have those questions, we could talk about them. And we can, we could, we do texts, we have journals, we do us all kind of ways that you try to create to communicate with your children. But you have to be able to, to teach the children balance, to teach balance. And, and we have to, it is so easy in this day and age, my wife and I are raising teenagers Y'all make us sick. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> y'all got all got they got all grown children. But uh we're raising teenagers and we're learning the balance of choice. We're learning that when they can choose and when they can't choose. One of our children said, Why you always gotta tell me what to wear on this such a day, on this such an occasion, so that you can learn the difference. You can learn the difference. We have people coming for job interviews looking all kind of ways. Like certain things, there are certain standards that are just gone. And people hire people who come in looking any kind of way. That's why they do it. Because there's a labor shortage. A labor shortage, right. <laughs> and again, it, it, this also goes back to the communication piece because what parenting is teaching me in this season See, when I grew up, it was because I said so. Absolutely. You no know, there that. was no explanation. And I had to accept that. Otherwise, I would see myself on the other side of next year. No, so, <laughs> but what our, our teens are teaching us is to be more um, open in communication. And it's also teaching them, them how to communicate. Yep. Because, but, because what I said so is really not enough, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and I, I get it. It's, you know, it's a level of respect thing as well, but why are you saying I can't wear what I want to wear? Why are you saying that? And, and it's the lesson that we teach them and what we're communicating with them. So what that's also doing is it's opening up another level of communication between the parent the parent and the child. Because we wonder, you know, I mean, yeah, communication is a skill. It's a skill that is learned and developed over time, and it's also modeled. Mm -hmm. And so as we model that communication with our children, and we graduate from <laughs> because I said so, to I'm teaching you how to dress in various environments. You know, I'm teaching you you know, what is appropriate for this and what's appropriate for that, et cetera, et cetera, just using that as an example. So it's, it's opening communication or uh, expanding communication or growing communication or developing communication. That's really good, and I'm going to get us start to wrap up. But Kelly, you said something about uh, when we're talking about the parenting piece that when they, I don't remember exactly how you said it, but the way parents, some parents are giving the children everything they want, and you just made the same connection, honey, that we're robbing our children of genuine life lessons, of character development. Like, what are, I refer to my parents all the time. I just called my dad the other day, and I was like, man, you taught me this, and I'm using this, and I'm yeah. teaching other people this. What will our children's children say that their parents taught them? You know, what values, what life skills, you know, I am learning that children, before they do what you say, they do what they see you do. Absolutely. 
And it's sometimes, and my wife and I have these conversations all the time, it's not until we see our children do things and have conversations away from us that we realize, what you say? You know, she got it. He got it, right? They were listening the whole time. And we have this little joke going on right now in our family that every time you say or do something to our children, every time you say or do something that reminds you of your mother or I or something I would say, you put $10, your own $10, in your savings account, right? And so, and I started doing it and I was like, ooh, I gotta put $10 because I'm quoting my parents or I'm doing what my parents are doing. And so we laugh about it, but it's amazing to watch them develop and you see those things. So I think that, that it's, it's good to encourage parents. Sometimes parents just need to be encouraged and not just beat up. You ain't doing it. You ain't. When I was a kid, I couldn't do this. And when my mama, man, if my grandma was alive, she'd have chewed you up. Encourage these parents. Because, you know, people, they teach us not even to use the word weaknesses anymore. You have strengths and you have challenges. How do you navigate those challenges? And when you, when you love people and help them through their challenges, they're going to be more receptive. And you can take a young woman or a young father and, and nurture them into being good parents and teaching them skills and values and say, instead of saying, you don't be talking to that girl like that, that you, you her mama, you, you know whatever, ask a question. I'm learning the power of questions. Is there a different way you could have said that? Could you have asked that a different way? And it makes the person think. Parenting is very intentional, and I think a lot of young parents miss the intentionality of parenting. But they need the, the, the seasoned parents, not just seasoned in age, but experience. That's what I'm looking for. Experienced parents to come alongside them and offer them and love the parent. Yes, the village. Love the parent to the place where they can nurture their children and be comfortable to reach out and say, you know, hey, Reverend Dixon, I, I'm struggling with this. Can you help me out with this? You know, hey, Ruth, how, how did you raise your son? To, you know, and talk about that. Because I promise you, some parents are going to say it was hard, mm -hmm. and I didn't know I got it right until I had a grandchild. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? You just never know what you're going to get. So I wanted us to end by 830. I didn't want to go too far over. Uh, just one last time, I want you, our, our guest, if you don't mind, to share um, really your practice, what it is that you do, and if people want to reach out to you, how can they contact you? Well, um, currently I'm still in the school system, um, but I do um, life coaching. Um, I counsel, and I have a business called Healing Life Juices. Um, so I do, you know, I juice, and um, I actually teach people how to detox the body. Um, so it falls under the, 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 the line of, even though it's, it's form of counseling also. Um, so I can be reached out. I, I, I guess I can, I guess we can put it on the, uh, yeah. 708-769-1595. Um, Again, 708-769-1595. Okay, and I currently work, still work in the school system by day, but by evening and weekend, I maintain a private practice, the Anxiety Stress Center in Homewood, Illinois. And I can be reached at 708-420-8997. Okay, I, I can't type that fast. <laughs> uh, media team, can you all add that? Are you able to do that from your side? 708-420-8997. Awesome, 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 awesome. Um, okay, cool. All right, so um, Janelle, Healthy Lives Juicing, I think we have all <laughs> had our experience yeah. with that. Uh, consultations and the juicings. Janelle is one of our vendors for the vendor fair coming up on this Saturday. So here's my uh, shameless plug for uh, <laughs> spring pop-up shopping here at Calvary Covenant Church of Chicago this Saturday, May 14th from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. 
Janelle Cox Bay of Healing Lives Counseling, Healing Lives Juicing will be here. So you can ask some questions. Um, she's trained in this. She's got a certificate in this. She knows what she's doing. Uh, all organic products. She'll be here this Saturday along with about 15 other vendors. I talked to Felicia today and the numbers have shot up just since Sunday. Uh, so make sure that you are here uh, to support the, uh, the spring pop up uh, and be able to uh, support all of our vendors who are coming out. And so um, this is this is what we want to push for the month of May and beyond is that family is important. God has ordained family. God expects us to do family. And I say it often. He does not expect us to do life alone. And so we do need that village. We do need that faith community to help us move forward. So whatever it is that you're needing, uh, what you're looking for, reach out for the resources. Um, we are Thomas and Thomas of Thomas Consulting and Counseling Services um, and Be More Productions, not therapy com connected just yet. Um, I'm Dr. British soon uh, working on pastoral counseling. Amen. Uh, working in that effort and uh, maybe music therapy will be mixed or, or, or be the, the, the hybrid baby to come out of that. And so, listen, therapy is necessary. Counselors are great. Um, we are a good support to medication. We are a good alternative in many cases to medication and vice versa. And I agree with you, Janelle, just like any other practitioner, uh, you should interview a therapist. You should do the research on them. You should ask them a lot of questions. And if your first session doesn't work, don't say, see, I told you counseling ain't for me. That might not be the case, all right? Um, so just wanted to do that. And I apologize. We did not get a chance to take questions from Facebook. But thank you all for the comments that you, uh, that you have shared. I'm going to try to read the last ones that came in. That was really good about the emotional maturity piece. Uh, someone said lack of identity. Crisis is not understanding whose you are. Right. And so when you understand the identity and where you come from spiritually and naturally, that helps. Uh, great conversation. Someone says someone says because parents didn't have consequences to something said here. The respect line needs to be taught. Uh, parenting classes are needed today. Society has robbed this generation of adults of trying to be a to be parents. They don't know how to be healthy adults. That's very powerful. Uh, someone said, you cannot change a place where you have not first loved. Uh, you cannot change a place where you have not first loved. And so parents, someone else said, are the first teachers. Parents are the first teachers. Listen, you all, this has been great. Um, I'm going to ask my wife to just share any closing thoughts, remarks, and pray us out and thank our guests. Absolutely. Well, yes, I want to thank our guests. <laughs> And we want to thank you who are here live in person and also those of you who are joining us virtually. Thank you so much for you have tuned in to Calvary Covenant Church of Chicago where we have had this evening talking about family, our mental health, family matters, family issues. And notice the key word there is family. So you all are family. Those of you who are watching virtual, virtually, you are family. And the key matter that we want to remind you to keep in mind is to what? Pay attention to your mental health. Pay attention to your mental health. So all of the remedies that you heard tonight and more, go ahead and watch the replay and write it down. Take note. Reach out to these ladies because they are skilled. They, they love what they do and you, you will be in good hands, okay? So we appreciate you for joining us on tonight. Thank you so much. These are professionals here. We wanna give them a, a round of applause. <laughs> and we hope to be able to do this again um, soon as well. And, and you know, you're always welcome. The door's open to you. And those of you who uh, also are able to come on Saturday, we will see you Saturday at 11 a.m. So we're going to close out in prayer. If there's nothing else. Oh, 
also, yeah, of course, we cannot leave out Thomas CCS <laughs> Consultant Services. Lord have mercy. Yes, um, Anthony. Rthomas.com is the website that you may visit to find more information about Thomas Consultant Services. And there are a plethora of services that are under the umbrella of Thomas Consultant Services. So again, visit us at www.anthonyrthomas.com for more information. Come on, girl. Well, you got the message. There you go. Write that down. <laughs> okay, so we're uh, we're gonna go before the Lord, before the throne of grace. Father, we thank you, God, for all that has been shared this evening. Father, the information, the knowledge, Father. We people perish because they don't have knowledge. And we thank you, God, for instilling the knowledge in your vessels who shared on tonight father thank you for those who were open to hear and receive and listen and will also take this information and use it move forward with it father we we pray even a spirit of of courage upon individuals father that uh shame will not be in the picture father but that there will be boldness and courage father to make next steps to seek help that is needed father lord thank you for for even showing them the direction that is needed father in taking those next steps father lord god allowing them to see oh god and discern father uh whom you have placed in their lives father uh, that will help them, God, get to their next, Father. So we pray, oh God, that the seeds of wisdom and knowledge that have been planted on this evening, God, that they will be uh, watered and they will harvest, oh God, and, and that we will be uh, even just overall a community of mentally healthy individuals, Father. Father, we pray for families, oh God, every family that is represented, Father, in person and virtually, Father, we pray, God, that you continue to, to move in families and, and promote healthiness within the family, oh God. Father, we thank you, oh God, for even uh, allowing the matters that are hidden, Father, to be uncovered, Father, and that they will be dealt with, oh God. God, with wisdom and with love, Father, we thank you, oh God, for moving in the family, Father. Even now, we pray for just continued comfort over the family. We pray against the plans of the enemy over the family. We, we come against them because we know that he is out to destroy the family, but we pray against Against it in the name of Jesus. We bless your name, Father, for the victory over families, Father. God, we thank you, oh God, for love, oh God, permeating throughout our families, oh God, in our communities, Father, and that we will be better community for one another, Father, that we will care more for one another, that we will be more concerned for, for not just ourselves or our four and no more but that we would be concerned about those who you allow us to to be in our surroundings father lord god help us to walk in the love that you've called us to walk in even as the light of the world father lord god we thank you oh god for we pray for our communities uh individually wherever we live father and we pray for the communities as a whole and we pray for our our individual communities, our individual circles, Father. Lord God, there are so many things going on mentally, physically, spiritually, but Father, we put them on the altar tonight, Father. We come together, oh God. God, lifting up one another, Father. Interceding for one another, Father, because we're all striving, Father, to get to that place, God, that you have called us to be, Father. So, Father, we just speak strength, oh God, 
to one another. We speak uh, healing, God, in the mind, in the bodies, oh God. We speak life, God. We speak life. We speak life, God. Oh, Father, we thank you. Even that person who is attempting suicide or even have had suicidal thoughts, oh God, we thank you now for intervening with your Holy Spirit because you know the root of the matter. And Father, we pray that you will speak to the root of the matter and up, uproot it in the name of Jesus and meet the need of that individual like only you can. God, we know you to be the true healer, God. You are the true healer, God. And if that person just can, can call on you, can call the name of Jesus and, and, and just gather in their hearts that you are who they need, Father. Lord God, we know that you can do it, Father. You, you can work faster than any medication. You can work faster than in the individual, Father, because you're omnipresent and you're right there, Father. Someone need a quick work done, Father. Someone need your, your hug, God. Someone needs your hands to just surround them, oh God. Father, remind that individual who needs to know that they are loved. Remind them, God, that you love them. You are a God of love. You are love. Oh, God, reveal yourself to them even now in the midst of that matter. Reveal yourself, oh, God, like only you can. And may their hearts be open to receive, God. Their hearts must be open to receive. So we pray for the hearts of individuals. We pray for the hearts of individuals, Lord. Touch the hearts of individuals, Father. Soften the hearts, oh, God towards you and towards your word and towards your truth and truth is you are love father may we all father represent your love like you desire and called us to represent it father help us all strengthen us all god we look to you and we thank you father we thank you god You've given us the grace that we need. Now teach us how to lean into it every day that you allow us to see. May we lean into your grace to do what you called us to do and to be who you've called us to be. So we thank you and we pray this prayer in your son Jesus' name. And we speak that it is so and we speak life in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you again for watching. Those of you who came out tonight that were part of our live audience for your comments, uh, your sharing, and those of you online, thank you all. God bless you. Mind the heat. Um, and I usually say this all summer long. What am I going to say? Hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. Y'all, I say that all the time. So we'll see you all on Saturday. I need y'all to pack this place clean out. I want every vendor to walk away sold out, encouraged. And next time we ask them to come, they're going to fill up all the spots. Amen. We want to be a blessing to all of our vendors. God bless you all and have a great night. Be well.